question. Scripture is God's word, right? And when God speaks, we obey, right? Right. Okay. So, when we come across material in God's Word that we do not understand or that winds up running counter to what we have thought for our lives, I bring that up because that's what we're going to be confronting over the course of the rest of this book. Because as you start working your way, as we start unpacking each of these chapters, there is a sustained argument that I make in this book that has led people to not speak to me anymore. Um, not a lot but there are a few that have come across the core of my argument and when they realized what I was saying they cut off all communication so the question that you're going to be facing in the upcoming weeks is as we go through and I present what all of this means. How are you going to react when it contradicts everything you've been taught up to this point? Ask questions. Hmm? Ask questions. Okay, well, that, that's a rich start. So, with that in mind, I have been talking for the past 10 weeks or so, laying out the foundation of what is behind what we're doing, not only in explaining this book, but in Christianity in general. The foundation of Christianity, we've talked about that. Then we went into the understanding that God's sovereign actions control everything in the universe. He owns it, he created it, it's his. And then we talked about how that plays out in particular areas. Our lives, nations, kings, etc. And then we went into the discussion of the kingdom of heaven being manifested on earth. And what I have not done up until today, and I'm going to do it today, is I'm going to present two images for you today. Um, this is going to be a little longer than the previous uh, lecture on in chapter two, but I want to flesh this out so that it's important. I'm going to talk to you about <coughs> what was being communicated into earth. In other words, when God descended and created the kingdom of heaven on earth, what was going on? Um, and the second thing is I want to show you the specifics, the elements of that kingdom that are communicated into earth. And if you've gone through chapter 2, you've already seen this in the diagrams I have. But I'm going to explain it. And before we do that, let's begin with the scripture that paints the picture of what is taking place in the heavenlies. So, Roz, Ezekiel, what we, Ezekiel 3.12. Then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me the voice of a great earthquake. Blessed be the glory of the Lord from its place. Read a little bit more. It was the sound of the wings of the living creatures as they touched one another, and the sound of the wheels beside them, and the sound of a great earthquake. The spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, the hand of the Lord being strong upon me. And I came to the exiles at Tel Aviv, who were dwelling by the Chabar Canal, and I sat where they were dwelling, 
and I sat there overwhelmed among them seven days. So winged creatures floating, flying, hovering. Um, Lynn, does he pretend one of those? Then I looked, and there above the expanse over the heads of the cherubim was something like a throne with the appearance of lapis lazuli. The Lord spoke to the man clothed in linen and said, Go inside the wheel work beneath the cherubim. Fill your hands with blazing coals from among the cherubim and scatter them over the city. So he went in as I watched. Now the cherubim were standing to the south of the temple when the man went in. And the cloud filled the inner court. <coughs> then the glory of the Lord rose from above the cherub to the threshold of the temple. The temple was filled with the cloud, and the court was filled with the brightness of the Lord's glory. Temple, throne, cherubim, and a phrase is repeated, the glory of the Lord. Okay. See this book? It'll, I'll, I'll give you the I'll give you the book in an email. Images of the Spirit. Okay? Sarah Klein was my Old Testament professor at Westminster. When you talk, when you read about the glory and the cloud, this is the single best treatment of that from a conservative Old Testament scholar that you're going to find. It's only 120 something pages, but I can tell you it is packed. Every page is packed with concepts that you will have to unpack. So I'm going to give you a thumbnail right now, something on which to hang, hang your thinking as you progress through this, because I, you may read Glory Cloud in the book as you're going through the book and not know what that means. Very simply, and I'm really <laughs> treading on heresy by saying it's simply, but very simply we're talking about when you see the glory of the Lord Glory spirit, glory cloud, what you are seeing, what you are seeing is the pre-incarnate Christ. This is pre-incarnation. And in other words, he's present when you read glory cloud, glory spirit, that's him. And I mean, he is there. Now, obviously, we would have the Godhead as well, but keep this in mind. Because when you go back and you start piecing together where the glory cloud appears, it is everywhere in Scripture. The glory of the Lord hovered over the earth at the, at the creation, right? The cloud hovered over the earth in the Exodus and attended their journey, right? And I mentioned this in the book. Cloud descended on Mount Sinai. The cloud appears at the baptism of Christ. The cloud represents the divine council. So Christ is part of the divine council, and while you see it in the Old Testament, he is there in his pre incarnate form, and in the New Testament, it is the Father and the Spirit with the divine council attending to the divine Son on earth. Okay? Who had Ezekiel eleven twenty two? John. From the King James Version. Ooh, you author right. It was good enough for Paul, it was good enough for me. Then did the cherubim lift up their wings and wheels beside them, and the glory of God of Israel was over them and above. Now this is what you're what you're reading. This is taking place in heaven. All of this activity is taking place in heaven. Diane, Ezekiel 43, 2. And behold, the glory of the, of the God of Israel was coming from the east, and the sound of his coming was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. The glory of the Lord over the waters, right? Where do you see that in Scripture? I just met it. That was Genesis. Genesis chapter 6 with Noah, right? After Noah was floating around, around, who is it that with the breath of his nostrils dries up the land? Right? And we can, and we can go on and on and on. So I, I want you to get this image. There is activity here. 
This is not just a cloud floating over. Oh, look, it's going to rain. That's not what we're talking about. Oh, uh, Daniel 7. Teresa. Yeah, this is a great passage. Not that Brother Carl is interested. Daniel's declare, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And the four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear, it was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast with four heads, the beast had four heads, excuse me, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered their horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little horn, which was three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, this horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth to speak great things. And I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat, whose clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool, whose throne were fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire, a stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. Do you see the picture that's being painted here? All of this action, all of this activity, a thousand thousand worshiping and ministering, to the Ancient of Days, to the pre-incarnate Christ, all of this is all of this is taking place in the heavenlies. Carol, Revelation fourteen. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You want to meet an angel? <laughs> you want to have a face to face? Six wings, the face of a man, four eyes, and eyes everywhere on his body, even under his wings. You're a better man than I am, Gunga Dan, if you want to meet an angel. I have no no desire in their actual form. But do you get the picture? There is all sorts of activity. There are any number of individuals, whether angels or ministers or whomever, that are worshiping within this heavenly community. Okay? Now I want you to listen very carefully. Do you know what God looks like? You want to? You don't want to know what God looks like? 
I'm curious. Well, Scripture tells us. I'm going to read to you the chapter of Scripture that specifically tells us what God looks like. Ezekiel chapter 1. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kabar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Butzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kabar, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself. And the brightness was all around it and radiating out of its midst four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces, and each one had four wings. Their legs were straight. The soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. The hands of a man were under their wings on their four sides, and each of the four had faces and wings. Their wings touched one another. The creatures did not turn when they went but each one went straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man. Each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side. Each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side. And each of the four had the face of an eagle. Thus was their faces. Their wings stretched upward. Two wings of each one touched one another and two covered their bodies, and each one went straight forward. And they went wherever the Spirit wanted them to go, and they did not turn when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went lightning, and the living creatures ran back and forth, in appearance, like a flash of lightning. Now as I looked at the living creatures, behold, a wheel was on the earth beside each living creature with its four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their workings was like the color of beryl, and all four had the same likeness. The appearance of their workings was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel, when they moved, they went toward any of the four directions. They did not turn aside when they went. As for their rims, they were so high, they were awesome. And their rims were full of eyes all around the four of them. When the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from earth, the wheels were lifted up. When the spirit Whenever the Spirit wanted to go, and wherever the Spirit wanted to go, they went, because the Spirit went. And the wheels were lifted together with them, for the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those went, these went. When those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up together with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. The likeness of the firmament above the heads of the living creatures was like the color of awesome crystal, stretched out over their heads. And under the firmament, their wings spread out straight, one toward another. Each had two, which covered one side, and each had two which covered the other side of the body. When they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of many waters, like the voice of the Almighty, a tumult, like the noise of an army. And when they stood still, they let down their wings. A voice came from above the firmament that was over their heads. 
Whenever they stood, they let their wings down. And above the firmament, over their heads, was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. Also from the appearance of his waist and upward, I saw, as it were, the color of amber with appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around, like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. God bless the reading of his word. Now, obviously, it doesn't give you a picture of who God was. But it gives you the general outline of the glory of the Lord. You notice the wheels? And they move and they stop. How many people, how many people have you spoke to that have said, oh, flying saucers, they look like giant wheels in the sky? <laughs> This is not a flying saucer. <laughs> this is the glory of the Lord. And in other places in Scripture, which we don't have the time to look at today, but if you go through this book, it will tell you, it points out why this is specifically the presence of the divine council. This is the, this is the chariot of God moving throughout the face of the universe. Now this, all of what we've discussed this morning in microcosm is what's taking place in heaven. So when we get to this, and it's in the book, so don't freak out. You don't have to try to copy this down. It's on page 37. When we get to this, and we have been talking about how the kingdom of heaven intrudes into the kingdom of earth. All of what we've just read, that's what's coming down. That's what descended in Genesis. That's what descends when Yahweh clears the water out for Noah. That's what descends in Exodus. That's what we're talking about when we hear the Godhead say about the Tower of Babel, let us go down and see what they're doing. Let us. Thousands upon thousands are making this appearance. And on Mount Sinai, when this was communicated to Moses, and he went up, and the cloud descended on the top of Mount Sinai, that's what was going on. That's what he saw when he went up into the cloud at the top of Mount Sinai. How in the world does a human being describe that? Unless it's revealed to him. Moses would have had no reference point to say any of this. God had to tell him, Moses, this is what you're seeing. Now, write it down. So we've talked about how this, what we have here, is a reproduction, it's a copy, it's a shadow, it's a, pa it's a pattern of what we, what we just read. Now do you see why this has to be a copy? There's no way any of that could be actually physically reproduced here on a, but we're not left devoid of images. Because if you'll remember in the description of the reproduction, Yahweh tells Moses, you need to do this, that, and the other thing. You need to bring these images to bear. Light is present. That's where we have the candles. 
right? We know that angels are all over the place up here. What's embroidered into the front of the veil, right? The seraphim are embroidered in the front of the veil. The angels are there so that when the priest walks into the holy place, he sees that every single time. These images are communicated from heaven to earth via revelation to Moses. Now, what we usually think when you hear everybody talk about this is we think how this works is this. Right? We think that into the Old Testament and then into the New Testament. And then this goes back to that. We invert this. But in reality, what's happening is all of the heavenly realities are communicated in the shadow, right? The Old Testament. And then the shadow points forward to the finished work in Christ in the New Testament. And this finished work gets its reality from the heavenlies because of the relationship between Christ and the Godhead. Okay? Getting blank stares. You got it? Is it, is it at least kind of understanding what's going on? This comes down in two, in two ways. It comes down into the Old Testament, which is a copy of what is going on up here, but it also comes down into the New Testament because it's fulfilled in Christ. And this points to that, points to Christ. We always talked about the Old Testament pointing to the New Testament, right? We always talked about symbols in the Old Testament pointing to Christ. Well, there it is. That's what, that's what we're talking about. Now, so we see the broad picture this panorama, this flurry of activity in heaven as it manifests itself in the cloud because we have in the Old Testament the pre-incarnate presence of Christ descending upon the top of Mount Sinai, yes? I want to be sure I've got something right. I thought when you said the glory cloud, you said that that was seeing the pre-incarnate Christ. So when you say here with the glory of the Lord, that when we're reading that in Ezekiel, is that pre-incarnate Christ? Pre-incarnate Christ, not God the Father. Though I know there's, you know. it's the whole. When when the best way to clarify it is this: we're talking about the entire Godhead, but when we talk about the entire Godhead, the pre-incarnate Christ is present. Okay. 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 That's fine. So, so it's that's not just the pre-incarnate it's not, Christ. It's, it's the God. it's all of them. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so when this makes its appearance onto earth look at what it brings with it this is what is this is what we've read was taking place and there are numerous other scriptures but I've listed just the references in Revelation and as I said this is on page 37 so don't worry about it you're not missing anything it's right there in your book but look at what is taking place in heaven and brought to Moses on Sinai. Now here's an interesting element, Sunday worship. So the principle of one in seven comes into play even though in the Old Testament this isn't fulfilled. It's fulfilled here, right? But the Sabbath worship is fulfilled here. So the principle of one day in seven set apart to worshiping God makes its appearance very early. In the Old Testament, it's the Sabbath. But in the New Testament, in Revelation, we see it's Sunday. We see an altar in heaven. Now, if Christ is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament, why is there an altar in heaven? Right? Something to think about. We know there's no sacrifice going on because he's the eternal sacrifice. 
It will never be sacrificed again. His work is done. It is complete. We see in Revelation 4, and all of these references are in your book, so don't, again, I'm just pointing this out to make the connection. We see priests, I ministers. Think, yes? I think this is a, a mystic connection to say that it's an altar, but there's no sacrifice nope. because Christ was the yeah. soul by the altar. Because he's the, he is the altar. Christ is the altar. Mm -hmm. Remember in the Old Testament, we had the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat on top. That's where the sacrifice took place, right? Who was the mercy seat? Four. All of these references, from 113 to 19, we have clergy investments. Five. Lampstand. We briefly talked about that, right? Six. My favorite. Incense. And there we go. Seven. <laughs> chalice. The Greek is philos. Philios. Uh, I won't. It doesn't matter. But it means cup or bowl. This is what's being discussed in Revelation when you see the bold judgments. Now think about this. If it can mean chalice, what does that tell us every time we receive communion? We are receiving the sacrifice of Christ who took the judgment of God on himself. And we are partaking of that so that we are not judged. Every time you look at the chalice, every time you partake of that wine, you are looking at God's judgment on Christ. And through that, you are receiving his grace. Eight. The Gloria. Does any of this look familiar to anybody? Nine, the Alleluia's. Ten, did you know that the Sursum Corda that we say every Sunday, lift up your hearts, comes right from Revelation. Eleven, the Trishagion, or holy, holy, holy. Isaiah 6 and Revelation. And all sorts of references to antiphonal chanting. You like music? Here you go. The angelic host, back and forth, singing to the Lord. And then last but not least, chapters 2, 3, 5, and 8, verses 2 through 11, God's word is read. Now, turn to page 41 in the book. Everybody open to page 41, or did you guys forget to bring your book? You forgot to bring your book. We just went over all of this in heaven. This is what was communicated to Moses. Now how does this manifest itself to us when we get to the New Testament? Okay. No, I'm sorry. But uh, how does this manifest itself to us in its practical outworking of the kingdom on earth. Right here. Okay, turn to page 48. All of this in heaven gets translated into what you see 
on that page. This is how God establishes a kingdom. This is how kingdoms are established, right? You have leaders. Yahweh established 12 leaders, the patriarchs. He made special agreements or covenants, right? There were special prophetic, both initially predictive and prescriptive divine revelation. He was communicating to Moses. There was a right to be a part of this kingdom. Circumcision. There were instructions given when errors were committed. The sacrificial system. There was a place that we were to meet God. Now, I can go through each and every one of these points. I'm not going to because it's in the book. You can just look at it. Now, if you turn over to the next page and you do the comparison, the next page is the New Testament. And it's an expression of the kingdom in the New Testament. And what do you see? You see the same parallel in the New Testament that you see in the Old Testament. You've got 12 leaders. Right? You have a, you have a, there was a very unique relationship that occurs with these leaders. It's very interesting. If you read, I'm going to read Luke 22:29, "And I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one upon me." Couldn't be any clearer. Jesus says, "Here's my kingdom." Well, you know what the word bestow means in Greek? It means someone who has the right, the legal right, to execute a will. The Greek word, or the word that we use for testament, means will. The apostles were given the right by Jesus to execute his will. You know, a lawyer here, a lawyer can tell you what, how important the legal ramifications are for someone stepping into that position to have that right to execute that will. That means they have all authority to do so. That was given to the apostles by Christ. And you can go on and we can special covenant, we call that the new covenant, right? Special prophetic, both the new covenant, new predictive and prescriptive divine revelation in the New Testament like the Old Testament. Yes. When you talk about executing the will. So is that We will get to they can execute his yeah. will. They can leave their authority, that's pass right. their authority on to the elders. Exactly right. And that's and we will get to apostolic succession in a minute. I mean, not today, but we'll get to apostolic succession in the book because that's that's the set, that's the, lar- the longest chapter in the book. Is, well, no, it's not. It's the second longest. But the point is. But isn't that why out of 15 on page 51 is alluded to apostolic succession? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the text that I just read, the Luke 22 text, is the authority to do, is, is the, uh, the, uh, the text that proves it, and 15 is the explanation of it. Okay. All right? But there'll be a further explanation in the book. And this is... This is the issue that's going to, that is one of the issues that is going to create some consternation, if not with you, with people that listen to this. Because people believe that they have, because they have this in their hand, because they have a Bible, that with their ability and the right that they have to read that Bible, which we have, Scripture says, 
study, you show yourself approved. They think because they can do that, they have the authority to speak for the church. But who was given the right, the authority to execute Christ's will? The apostles. They were the only ones given that authority. So any authority that anyone has has to be derived through them. So can we assume that God is not present in every building that is labeled a church? Ah, there's, that's a great, great question. Because that is part of the consternation that people will have. That is why my friend no longer, not that he said no longer, but that's why he stopped reading the book and wouldn't talk to me for a while. Because he didn't understand that what I am saying is not that you're not a Christian. All I'm saying is that, and, and I'm not going to go any further into this because I, I dealt, I have an entire chapter on it and I, you know, I didn't unpack it completely. <clears throat> but just because you are a believer and you, can, and you have a Bible, that doesn't mean that you can tell everybody in the world what the true position on baptism is. You can't. You don't have that right. You have an opinion. Congratulations. Welcome to the human race. You have an opinion. But it doesn't mean you have the authority to say the church believes this. You don't. So on Sundays, when you have people gathering in, I'm not going to name a denomination, but you can pick one. It doesn't matter. Pick your favorite denomination. They're all gathering. If they're not in apostolic succession, if they don't have the authority to speak for the church, if they haven't been granted that by the apostles down through the derivative authority through bishops, what are they doing? It's a Sunday Bible study, that's it. It's not a church. It's just not. They are gathering for their own biblical edification, but they are not technically worshiping God, and we will get to that next week, because that's a very critical distinction, because we all have the not only right, but responsibility to worship God every single second of our lives, but there's a difference between that and what goes on on Sunday, and there's a significant difference, and we can see it right here. So would that not be false prophecy? Well, um, it would. Pro, well, <clears throat> I, it depends on what you mean by prophecy. Um, well, God speaking audibly to people and then having them write it down—that doesn't happen anymore. Okay, the Holy Spirit plucking around in your head and grabbing scripture out or something that you learn and then using that—that's prophetic. Okay, that's the foretelling of Scripture. We, hopefully, we're doing that all the time. I mean, I, I really, I mean, I hope we're speaking forth God's word. So when they do that on Sunday and they say we're a church, yes, you are correct. They are speaking falsely. They are not a church. Now they may have all the perfect doctrine in the world, but if they are not in apostolic succession, that's one doctrinal area where they're wrong. And that's the foundation, that's the bedrock upon which everyone else, which everything else uh, is founded. And we will, and we will get to that, I promise you. So, that's what I wanted to cover. I wanted to touch base. I wanted you to see that when I was talking about the kingdom coming down, I wanted you to see what was taking place in the kingdom. It was, I mean, in heaven, it is just replete with activity, nonstop. Remember, Isaiah says that the angels, that the, the seraphim, who are hovering above the throne and chanting, holy, holy, do that day and night. They never stop. And the thousand upon thousands in Daniel 7 never stop. And the activity of the cherubim never stops. It is a maelstrom, if you will, of God's action and activity. And that's what descends on Mount Sinai. It actually, it comes, 
into play earlier, but the clearest picture is on Mount Sinai. And this is what Moses is seeing, and this is what he can't understand, and this is what God divinely reveals to him. And no one on earth would ever have had the opportunity to see this. Not Moses, not Daniel, not Isaiah, not Ezekiel, not Stephen. Nobody would have the opportunity to know that this was going on unless God supernaturally revealed to them. So now keep this in mind, that this is all the things that are going on, and just to throw something out for your perusal over the week, the veil in the temple symbolizes the veil between heaven and earth. Now, while we don't see this, we can't pierce that metaphysical veil. We have pierced that spiritual veil through Christ. Because he now takes us into the Holy of Holies when we worship him. And when you go upstairs and on Sunday, you enter the sanctuary. You are entering the holy place. You've seen it in that. Look at it again today after we're done. And that rail is there so that we can approach boldly to receive the grace of Christ. Where we would never have been able to approach that we consider all of this and when we consider remember what I talked about when I talked about sin and I talked about holiness and I talked about God's holiness if you put all of that together there's no people no group of people no class of people on earth that has the obligation to be joyous than us because even if we fail we sin, we have Christ. We never, if we truly have Christ in our hearts, if we are clinging to that cross, we will never be separate from his love nor face judgment. Ever. Or we'll be judged for our works, not by that for our salvation. Oh, there's a crown you lost. <laughs> there's a crown you lost. Doesn't matter, we're all going to be giving it back to him anyway. Okay? All right, let me stop there, and I'm sure you've got questions. Yes, ma'am. Diane. At the incarnation, the kingdom of heaven is with us at that moment. Um, In the person of Christ. Hmm, how do I want to answer that? Um, yes, but. Uh, King, the kingdom of heaven is represented. Remember, it's a reproduction in the Old Testament. So, to the degree that you are dealing with faithful Jews worshiping in the temple, at least until 500 AD, um, well, and not until Babylonian captivity, but as long as there are faithful Jews, then the kingdom is in a veiled sense present but it doesn't reach its full manifestation with Christ when he says now the kingdom of heaven is among you now it is here in it well I, I'll say fullness but I say it with a, in a qualified manner okay. so the church visible though is not with us until after his resurrection. Oh no, the church, no. Um, the, the distinction between Israel and the church, that, that's a false distinction. The word used for church, ecclesia in the Greek, was used for synagogues. 
The word used for synagogues in the New Testament has also been applied to the church. The terms are interchangeable. That didn't become an issue until, until certain theological perspectives um, started to intrude into Christianity. But the minute, <clears throat> the minute there was two people present, there was a church. The minute Adam and Eve showed up, there's the church. There's your first church. I had some uh, confusion about the terms synagogue and temple because you might hear a Jew of today say, okay, I'll see you at synagogue. Okay, I'm going to temple. Same thing? Yeah. yeah they don't, they, they, because the temple, has, the temple was destroyed, they, um, they've uh, conflated the two. Uh, and that actually happened very early on because they wound up building synagogues <coughs> that replicated the temple. But they were still synagogues. But there's no Ark of the Covenant, so they can't be a synagogue. It can't be a temple. They have the law, and they believe that the law, the Torah, has supplanted, not supplanted, but uh, essentially stood in the place of the Ark of the Covenant. This is why dispensational, I'm sorry, I don't want to get off on this, but this is why dispensationalism is, is so horrific for me. Because they're going to claim, or they don't, they're not going to, but they claim that when Christ physically appears on earth and sets up his thousand year reign, the temple is going to be built, rebuilt in Jerusalem. The Ark of the Covenant is going to be found or, uh, or rebuilt, and they're going to resume sacrifice in the temple with Christ present. No, go ahead. No. He was the ultimate sacrifice. Why do we need the. Well, you want to know their answer? Their answer is that, well, it's only. Christ is not. It's only. No, it's only. No, no, it's only. It's a memorial to him. We're not doing it for the forgiveness of sins. What we're doing is we're memorializing the great gift that he gave us. My response to that is so. You believe. He said, take this, my body and blood, don't mean you might. Explain what, uh, how, where are you going with that? What do you mean? Well, he, he created the Eucharist as a, as a memorial, I think. Well, it's more than a memorial. Well, it's more than Yeah. Yeah, but. Yes, I, I see your point. Yes. Okay. Um, when he said, it is finished, that meant that the complete transaction of the redemptive act, and, it was, and, and the term used, Tetelestai, test, Telestai is a business term. It, it is a term used in commerce in the, in the first century. So Jesus was basically saying, I paid the debt. I paid the price that was demanded by my father. And therefore, since payment in full has been made, it's done. It's finished. The sacrificial system is, com is over. I'm not sure he just Then fast forward to the millennial reign, and in a thousand years, Christ shows up, and sacrifices are reinstituted once again. However, according to them, that's not for the redemp not redemption. It is not for the forgiveness of sins. It is a memorial to Christ. Well, my statement then is so. Thousands of years of the most horrific, ghastly concept man has known. A sacrificial system where blood and death is required to redeem sin. Where Christ spends 33 years of his life looking at that sacrifice, knowing that's him. The most horrific experience he could experience because he was the sinless second person of the triune Godhead that took on human flesh and suffered for us. So you think all of that, plus his statement, it's finished, is meaningless. That's what you think? That he's going to be happy with that? The anamnesis, the memorial that you were talking about, the remembrance when we, when we read the words of consecration on Sundays, do this in remembrance of me. 
is a reference to the Passover. Because if you'll remember in the Passover celebration, what was taking place? The leader of the Passover would draw the family and friends together and then there would be one person, usually it's the young child, but sometimes children aren't available, but there would be one child that would say, and why do we do this this night? And what did they do? They recounted the entire redemptive work of Yahweh from captivity actually even before that, from Joseph to captivity to the exodus to their salvation. So they're recapitulating in this celebration the entire redemptive act of God and that's what we do on Sundays in the Eucharist when we are doing it in remembrance. It's not some empty element. We are reliving the entire redemptive work of Christ up to and including his ascension. And it is there that he gives us in that, in that celebration his grace. Because we partake of his broken body sacramentally. He's not physically being broken again but sacramentally and really and truly as you read this morning Diane because we are united by the Holy Spirit to Christ because Christ lives within us we are partaking of the entire person of Christ the divine and the human in that bread and wine so his body was broken for us and we partake of that and his blood was shed for us and that cup of judgment, that chalice of judgment, we partake of that which provides for us the grace of salvation and this is what people miss when they don't acknowledge that that only happens in apostolic confession I've heard people say I'm time and time again, well, you know, we can just have crackers and grape juice. Well, for us, no, <laughs> we can't, but you can have anything you want. If you want to have a Coke and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, do because it doesn't matter. You're not a church. You're a bunch of Christians getting together to do whatever you do. But you're not a church. And that chaps people. Questions? Wow, I can't believe I went through that. Nobody had a question. Uh oh, uh oh, I'm, I'm in trouble. Huh? Apostolic succession. That is correct. Without the apostolic Earlier said that when Adam and Eve were together, they were a church. Mm -hmm. Why did they need apostolic succession? They were having direct communion with God. <laughs> yes, my quizzical wife. So. It seems like almost a good majority of the churches that came out of the Protestant Reformation are not churches. Well, that is true. Um, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> we, well, we, in the 20 years that we've been together, when have you actually ever heard me identify myself as Protestant? I don't identify myself as a Protestant. I identify myself as a Christian. Because my faith began in the first century, and I don't mean that in trite, but we know that there was a church in Great Britain as early as the late first century, because Claudius, in the 40s, took a Roman contingent to Great Britain, and, and there were Christian soldiers, and they established Christianity in Great Britain. And I'm an Anglican, so... Whatever iteration came out of that is irrelevant because there was a church present. So I predate. We predate, if you think it properly. We predate Rome, Eastern.
Eastern Orthodoxy as formal organizational churches. Because in the first century, they were our brothers. We were all together. And the Reformation, while it did many wonderful things, the problem I have with the Reformation is what my wife just pointed out. It's their ecclesiology. The ecclesiology of the Reformation destroyed the cohesion of the church. Even no matter how people want to say, well, it was the great schism uh, between you know, Rome and Orthodoxy. All that did was create the two people that believed essentially the same thing and just refused to talk to one another. Now, the Reformation, when Anglicanism identified itself as something other than Rome in the Reformation, and now we have three essential archetypal churches, Anglicanism, Rome, and Roman Catholicism, the major breaks came through Anglicanism. trace all of the breaks from uh, the Reformation. Well, the Presbyterians, the Baptists, the Mennonites, the Men it doesn't matter. The, and if you look at uh, if you look at Lou Tarsitano's book, An Outline of Anglican Life, he lists the tree of Christianity and he shows where that break occurs. But it comes from that. It comes from us. Um, so yeah, I mean that's a problem. I'm sorry? Not for Luther. Uh, no. No. Luther, Luther, no. Luther was kicked out of the church. Um, but that formal bishop is so closely identified with. Yeah. I mean, if you look at, if you look at a traditional Lutheran service, especially at you know, Wisconsin um, or Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, um, pre, <laughs> again, pre- Let's say, let's say 1970, pre 1970, very similar, very similar to, well, just like us. If you look at an Anglican church choir, you know, we all would essentially worship the same way for the most part. But then they started changing things up where they, instead of uh, ad hoc, you say ad populum now, and priests are facing the congregation, and it's just like, you know. So, um, but when Luther packed the 95 Thesis on. Remember, Luther was doing that as a Roman Catholic. Luther was basically saying, I'm still a Roman Even though they were trying to kill him. Well, but he, when, he, when he did it, it, first of all, I don't know if you know, but he posted the 95 Theses in Latin. He didn't post it in German on the Wittenberg door. He posted it in Latin because he wanted it to be an academic discussion. He did not want to create controversy in the church. He wanted the church to deal with this, to answer these questions. Unfortunately, he had some very bright students that knew Latin, <laughs> and they just made copies and sent it all out, and then it became then it became a problem. But but Luther was in apostolic succession because he was a priest. Luther was within apostolic succession, but Luther and apostolic succession succession ended with that generation of Lutheran, of Lutheran priests. Because once they ended that, there were no longer any bishops in apostolic succession. So, sorry, my Lutheran brethren. <laughs> um, so, so this is, this is the argument. So when we say that the fracture came through Anglicanism, Lutheranism only produced Lutheranism. That's all it produced. I mean, different iterations of Lutheranism, but they were all they're all Lutherans. Whether it's the Scandinavian or the Swedish or the German Lutherans, it doesn't matter. They're all Lutherans. Essentially, if you ever went to any of the, it's going to be the same. Can't say that about what happened once Protestantism reared its head from Anglicanism. So Lutheran clergy today are not in. See what I mean? I'm telling you, it's people people get chapped if they follow the argument. You're following the argument. If we believe that church is an expression of the kingdom of heaven, yes. then the one thing we need to do is figure out what expression we're, we're getting ready to entertain in our lives through what church. 
Well, you know, how do you determine where you're going to worship? Yeah. And the first question that you have to ask yourself is, is this church an apostolic succession? And then the second question, which kills me that I even have to say this, but does this church have apostolic doctrine? And we'll get to the three marks of the church later on. I, I delineate those as to how you can make the determination. But we know a lot of people that are in apostolic succession and they've given up scripture. So then the question arises, well, are they still in succession? If succession provides authority, and that's what we're talking about, we're talking authority, we're talking about doctrine, and we're talking about practice, apostolic authority, doctrine, and practice. If you break any one of those three, then you're not in apostolic succession. See, now I'm way ahead of myself. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to stop. I'm not going to talk about that anymore because that's actually chapter 7. But See, that's a conferred gift yes. that can be rejected well, it, in it, it, by the... It, well, it can be apostatized. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. yeah. If I lay hands, uh, hypothetically, a bishop lays hands on me and I become a bishop and I suddenly decide that, oh, well... I think, uh, yes, God help us. Uh, I think, uh, I, I think you know, if that happens and I suddenly turn around and say, you know what, I think that ministers having only one wife is ridiculous. I think we should have multiple wives. Then I have, yeah, exactly. Then I have essentially repudiated scripture. What? We couldn't handle it. No, man. We can't handle one wife. I don't know why Mormons have more than one. They're idiots. Um, I would have said they can handle two mother wives. <laughs> That's even better. Way to go, Benita. But you see what I mean? When I, at that point, I have no. I have repudiated what scripture clearly has taught and what the church has clearly taught. Therefore, I have violated apostolic succession because I no longer have apostolic doctrine. So. How does that work with during the, I don't remember the exact years, but the 1200s or whatever, when they had like two popes and they were fighting each other, do the bishops that came out of the that? The papal are schism. They, are they still? Martin using, and all the other well, ones, I, yeah. I don't remember a lot about it, so they did that. Yeah. One or nor both of them seem to have been Problematic? Does that affect the apostolic succession that came from those popes who did those bishops? Well, you're at, you're talking now. You're talking about Rome. Well, true. Yeah. And when you but, talk about Rome, Rome is Rome is a um, Rome is a, a, a leviathan when it comes to this type of situation. She's a monster. Yes. <laughs> but if we follow the principle correctly, apostolic doctrine apostolic authority and apostolic practice. Rome repudiated apostolic succession when they dogmatized transubstantiation. And where did they do that? Well, it was first introduced in 1000. And I always get their names conf conf mixed up. <laughs> but I believe it was Rat Trumnus that advocated uh, advocated transubstantiation, and it was Red Virtus that argued okay. against it. So, if they failed that test in 1000, aren't like all our bishops nope. and priests in trouble? No, no, no. That's why I said Anglicanism exists independent of Rome. And has always been. But didn't we had an Archbishop of Canterbury, remember? Yeah. So. But weren't they ordained in the Roman Church? Yeah, but that but we're talking prior to one thousand. 
So unless you want to say that did, no, did no. They send. Uh, okay, here. I'll have to go through some. No, no. Here, here's the easy way to look at it. Did Anglicans ordain anybody prior to 1,000? Did Anglicans ordain anybody prior to 1,000? People in the British Isles Church. Yes, yes. Anglicans. Yes. Yeah. So then we're fine. We don't need. We don't need. Issues? We don't need Rome. That's that's what that's the point. The point is, once Rome went off the skids, it doesn't matter. Now you have to realize that at times there were some Roman yeah. priests that forth. came back and bishops came back, and and that's fine. But the problem is when. Let me let me erase this, and I'll show you. By the way, that's the argument that Rome is going to Oh, yeah. <laughs> huh? My brother is uh, Roman Catholic. Yeah, and that's, a, and that's the argument that they use. Oh, your order shall grow up. No, no. You don't need orders. You go to your stinking orders. Um. <laughs> okay. Understanding succession of apostolic succession is this. Apostle number one lays hands on guy number one and he's a bishop. Guy number one, guy A, lays hands on somebody and he becomes a bishop. And we think of it in, in a linear progression, right? That's not apostolic succession. This is how it works. Peter, James, and John get together and they ordain Sidney as a bishop. Right? What does Nicaea say? Two, two maybe, but three are required to consecrate a bishop. Right? 300, 320, so it's early. All right. Thomas Andrew and Bartholomew. They get together. And they were Dana Bishop. Right? 
John, Thomas, and Philip, Daddy, whoever, they get together and they ordain a bishop. You see what's happening? It's not a linear progression. Because you have three people and you have overlapping, everybody's lines of succession are, I don't want to say solidified, but protected. So now what happens? You have 40 bishops. And now you have that, these three bishops get together and they ordain a bishop. And then this bishop gets together with this bishop and this bishop and they get, see what I mean? So we're not dealing with this because if that happens, then a break is fatal. So we're dealing with this. We're dealing with this, I call it a spider web. It's, it's a myriad of, so now let's follow this, okay? So now we have these conclaves of bishops that have been ordained in apostolic succession, okay? And now we get to let's just say 1000 AD and we have the introduction of trans wait a minute it gives me chills when I say trans trans <laughs> substantiation okay so what happens? Do you have Anglicanism? And we have Rome. So who is ordaining? Anglicans are going to ordain Anglicans. Rome's going to ordain Rome, Romans. Is every priest within Anglicanism going to adopt transubstantiation? No. Is every Roman going to adopt trans? No, they were Roman Libertus. Rejected transubstantiation. Libertus, I, I believe. It's either a retromnus or Redbertus. I think it's Redbertus. So, so now we push this and we push this. Anglicanism exists. On its, and and I, I'm not saying this simply as a rational argument. This was actually brought up. I believe it was Leo. I can't remember, but he wrote he wrote a, um, a, a paper called denying denying the orders of Anglicans. But he did it based on on the Reformation. He didn't go back again. So this question has been resolved by nine Eastern Orthodox patriarchs and archbishops. It was appealed to the Eastern Orthodox. We are, this is, we are way in the weeds now. <laughs> uh, but he, they appealed to the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church said by the criteria established in Rome if Rome denies your orders, and this was the argument that Rome was saying we're invalid, then Rome's orders are invalid. So that question essentially was tabled. Now, they, don't, they still don't accept it, but they don't make an argument out of it because they lost that argument 200 years ago. So you still have a question. What's your question? Well, sort of a continuation. Okay, go ahead. Um, the three bishops that ordained another bishop. I thought that was the preferred, but that in times of crisis, like I would say 1978, they only used one bishop. Only used, no. no. One bishop is never valid. So how do you that? What happens is one, if they do that, he must immediately be conditionally consecrated after that. Has to happen. One, the consecration of one bishop, he's not a bishop. He's filling a position, and it's, it's not 
Not, not recognized. I thought that 1978. Well, 78 is the Episcopal Church. No, I thought it was um, when they set up the ACC and the, the St. Louis stuff. No. Oh, I'm totally missing. Yeah, no. We, um, I'll send you Eric, uh, Eric uh, Badshelter's uh, master's thesis. It's not. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not complicated. He wrote his, it's called, it's called one, uh, it's called Somebody is Everybody's Schismatic. That's what he titled it, <laughs> Master's Thesis. <laughs> it was actually quite good. Um, but he points out that the, the problem isn't that, um, the problem isn't that, that in, in 77, one, uh, one uh, only one bishop was available to consecrate uh, a, a priest to the to the Episcopal. The problem was there was a bishop in Korea, Bishop Pat, who gave his he gave his written consent to be the third bishop, and he subsequently said, "I never said that," <laughs> even though it was from even though it was registered and it was uh, documented that it did come from him. The, uh, the fact of the matter is that created the controversy that you're talking about. But no, regardless of that situation, one, one, one bishop consecrating another is never, okay. never going to happen. That, that just can't happen. Was consubstantiation a rebuttal of transubstantiation? Well, no Lutheran would accept your terminology of consubstantiation, but yes, it was a rebuttal to transubstantiation. Okay. Yeah, it was the they they will assert ubiquity. That's that's their argument that the body of Christ is ubiquitous. He's it everywhere. So he is over, under, with, around, um, overshadowing. Um, in but not the elements. Send you my. I'll send you the, the the history of Anglicanism that I have. Um, Anglican, the Anglican Church in Great Britain. Um, you have Benedictine monasteries. Yeah. Okay. was in England. I understand what she's saying. <laughs> <laughs> I've had to respond to this. <laughs> I've had to respond to this a thousand times. That's um, <laughs> what? I said, ask Henry. Rome was in England. <laughs> <laughs> Irrelevant. And the reason is this. Then how is that? I'll, if you'll let me finish. <laughs> <laughs> I like your blood, your cross. Thank you. The, uh, your Honor. Uh, <laughs> the Anglican Church in Great Britain at the beginning when they sent Peter, uh, when they sent uh, St. Patrick over from France, was a church, was a country divided into seven different kingdoms. All right. Now, regardless of um, what we're talking about in reference to Rome or Anglicanism, essentially what winds up happening is um, eh, my English friends are going to have a heart attack. Uh, Like it, 
<laughs> it looks like a deformed pear. Yes, it does. But anyway, when you're looking at when you when you're looking at how Anglicanism was um, delineated in, in the first six centuries, you have Scotland and Wales separating themselves from the rest of England. So this section of England was Roman. This section. London, um, Oxford, Cambridge. The, although Cambridge essentially was Protestant during the Reformation. But this was, this was uh, Roman. This was Protestant. So there wasn't there wasn't this monolithic expression of Christianity in in England, stating that okay, everybody in here is Roman Catholic because of because a Roman Catholic bishop decided uh, archbishop decided to come over from France. Oh. And if you look at the documents from this time. I'm getting tired of looking at that. <laughs> they really do look like a deformed bear. Um, if you look at the documents from that time period, what you find is that, number one, if you'll remember, Gregory the Great in the 600s was contacted by one of the bishops that he sent up there, and he said, well, they're doing this, they're doing that, they're doing the other thing. And Gregory essentially said, the Roman Catholic bishop, uh, the Pope, he basically said, look, if they're not doing anything heretical, leave them alone. So Great Britain was allowed to establish its own ethos. And Anglicanism has always had its own ethos. And what wound up happening later on, six, seven, eight, nine, when Rome started to, to take over, what you had was, and you can... You can look it up. Now, I'm going to state it colloquially, <laughs> but this is essentially what they were saying. I'm, I'm a Roman bishop. You're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're going to do this. And the Anglican bishops are going, yeah, 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 absolutely, pontiff, yes, yes, yes. And then they go do their own thing. <laughs> so they were Roman only in the sense that the authority over them was claiming supremacy when in reality they were for the most part they were doing their own thing. Now London and you know yeah they went Rome. But Scotland and Wales never, never ceded that to Rome. So it's it's not again, it's not a monolithic, you know, linear line. We have we have this tendency to think in, in from point A to point B and it's gotta be that neat and clean and it's not even close. It's not even on from Great Britain. <laughs> Any questions about what we talked about today? We drove Rose away. <laughs> no, her, her back was hurting. Oh, okay. She was sitting too long for us. Okay. Nothing? Oh, that, okay. Uh, this is just kind of a broad question. This last part, there's uh, church visible and invisible. There's kingdom lower K, kingdom high, you know, capital K. There's um, earthly kingdom. I'm just, I kind of reached a point where I'm not really sure what's what. Uh, when you talk about invisible versus visible, sort of have, you know, obviously know what invisible and what visible means, so I'm not sure what that means in relation to the ch church, an invisible church. I don't know if I'm not, maybe I'm not making a lot of sense, but it just seemed like. You're like, but what about the religion of the visible church to the kingdom, lowercase k? So what, visible church, the church we see, to which kingdom? I mean, there's just... Yeah, but what's the context? The context will tell you... Well, I tried. Uh, what, what page are you on? I'm on, that was on page 54. Okay. So that was okay. I opened right to it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Down at the bottom, the last, but what about... The point of this is to interact with Protestants that reject the idea of the kingdom being visible. 
that that's what when you that say is. the kingdom you mean the kingdom capital K kingdom of God down on yes earth. Okay. yes okay however when we start talking about um, let me look at that section that you said when you talk about the visible the, the relation of the church to the visible kingdom the question comes if the church is an expression of the kingdom how do we have sinful people in it that's why it's the small k. All right? Because you can't have pagans in heaven. So what happens? So what we have is what Jesus is telling us in the Gospels. We have the kingdom. It is represented by the church. Small k. But it is represented by the church. However, it's not the pure kingdom of God because we have wheat and tares. We have sheep and goats. When I see something that says capital K, kingdom... That's kingdom of God, heaven, mm -hmm. all of that. When I say, see, kingdom, Small. lowercase k. Think about that in relation to the church. It's the, if it's come down, that's the, kind of the, it, the shadow of what's up above. Connected to the, the church. church. Connected yes. to the church. Yeah. Because that poses a lot of uh, challenges for people. This, can't, this is why some people say, well, this is not the kingdom of God because we have sinners. Well, yeah, it is. If Jesus can say, if I am among you and I'm bringing the kingdom of God with you, and then he says, oh, but by the way, you're going to have wheat and tares, yeah. you know, then you have, to, you have to start looking at this more sharply. Yes. Okay. So when you say the visible church versus the invisible church. Right. The that, visible church, you don't mean this building here. Or yes. This building. Yes. You I mean, I mean the, the, rep, the expressions of the church in physical, uh, okay. in a physical way, yeah. Okay. And invisible church, you mean? I mean, everybody. Everybody that's here. A Christian, this, yeah. This, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Reread it with that. Okay. <laughs> Your question caused Diane to have a twitch. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's her turn for a question. Is that? little church upstairs basically laid out like a temple with the narthex where you enter and then the pew where the believers would receive the word and then the holy of holies where we receive Christ and did you did you have a chance to look at the diagram for the I, temple and the yeah I did and that's why I'm thinking is that us? Yeah. I mean yeah. And all of those other things that I pointed out on the other side. Priests and incense. And this is why I asked at the very beginning, if God commands it, are you going to do it? Are you going to obey it? Should we have incense in church every time? Every time we walk in to worship God, yes. yes. We should have bells. We should have incense. Priests yes. should be vested. We should have chanting at a minimum. We should have chanting. We should have all of these things. Lights. Yeah, lights. We should have candles. I know more, more candles than what we have. Uh. My wife is telling me don't answer that question. I did lights in your turn. I'll leave the fifth. Leave the fifth. On, the advice, the, on the advice of counsel. Uh, I'm working on it, Lynn. I need to raise about a thousand dollars to get the brass candles. No, here's the, here's, the, here's the thing. Here's the thing. The first, and I, and I'll and I'll say this um, as genuinely as genuinely as I can say this. The first issue usually is finances. That's usually the, the problem. Is so that's why, if you remember, I said a couple of weeks back, you do what you can with what you have to the best of your ability. It's the intent and the desire to truly worship God in spirit and truth. That's what in spirit and truth means. Not any way that I feel I'm going to worship God. It means in spirit and truth is to take his word and try and truthfully and with the ministry of the Holy Spirit implement this in our, in our churches. Um, there are other issues. Um, there are theological issues that ha have cropped up over the years that have kind of put a, uh, a stigma on doing all of that. And then there's the practical, and I don't mean to offend anybody, and this is where my attorney is going to lecture me later, but 
there are people that simply complain. No, because they don't understand what's happening. This is the point of my book. I don't, look, let's be real. I don't expect everybody in the universe to agree with me. I don't. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm surprised when people actually do agree with me. But what I would hope and pray is that God would use this book to create discussion. Let's argue this stuff out. Because I've laid out a pretty clear... I'm going to read something to you. I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to read this to you because it's pertinent to this coming I have um, a colleague that he, he petitioned, the, he's a professor of uh, medieval literature at the College of the Ozarks at St. Louis University, so he's a, he's, he's a headhead. Um, and he petitioned the College of the Ozarks to buy my book and put it in the library. And this is what he told me. And I, I'm embarrassed to read this, but it, it points, it, it bears on this discussion. I'm reading your book at the same time as Bray's book, Reformed Anglicanism. Do you know who Gerald Bray is? One of the leading church scholars, church historians in the world. His book is fine, but when it comes to liturgical issues, yours is what I would call not to put too fine a point on it, vastly superior. Of course, his focus is different, but some lack of, but some of his lack of nuance, and his lack of nuance is painful. The academic acumen, ease of reading, and, and <laughs> ease of reading, and powerful case you're making is so far is genuinely impressive. Now, I don't seek that. But that's the type of interaction that I'm hoping to generate. Because the most important thing that we can do here on earth is properly worship God. Because it involves all of the other things that we are as Christians. It involves the spreading of the gospel. It involves the advancement of the kingdom. It involves forgiveness of sins. It involves the reception of grace. It involves all of these things. And we are heirs of the king, so why are we acting like we're paupers? Why are we not doing what he has gifted us to do? And we have, if we do it right, the most moving, beautiful worship service anywhere. The only thing that I believe comes close to us when we do it right is Eastern Orthodox. I love my Eastern Orthodox brethren when they worship. My gosh, you want to know what it feels like to be in heaven? You go to an Eastern Orthodox, go for an hour because they worship for three hours. But, <laughs> but it is magnificent. You are overwhelmed, and that's what we should be, overwhelmed with who our God is. And that overwhelming feeling should drive us to gratitude and love and recognition of how unworthy we are and how blessed we are. Because our Savior gave us his life. And we get the privilege, the right, and the responsibility and obligation to participate in that sacrifice, to receive his sacrifice in the whole person of Christ, in the body and the blood, in the bread and the wine. Uh, question. I very much like these elements of incense and bells, the bells and smells, all that. But <clears throat> if we had that every Sunday, wouldn't you then have parishioners who would say, well, it's too high church for me. I can't follow it. All right. Then let's get back to the very first question I asked you at the beginning. God commands it. Are we supposed to obey it? And that's and I'm gonna, and I'll just throw this out right now. 
I'm going to continually repeat that question as we go through it. Because that's the question that has to be maintained as we look at this. If God commanded, then we not can, but must do it. And there's the argument. There's the argument. Well, if God commanded that, then that's what the book is. I think I'm making my case for, yeah, God commanded it. And he commanded to do it this way on the on the back. I think a big reason that it doesn't happen is, you know, I've been in the Episcopal, Episcopal Church and this my whole life. I've never heard anything explained like this, like the apostolic confession, the reason for doing stuff. It was just like, oh, the bells are nice. The bells are pretty. The, some people like the smell of the incense. And they used to use it to hide the smell of all the animals and the body odor. And, you know, you just, you don't hear that it's uh, part of the um, ceremony. You hear all the other reasons for it, and they always do it. And all the secular niceties. And then so it sort of becomes a, well, you know, if somebody doesn't like the smell, and we're going to drive people out, and we're going to, you know, blah, 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 blah. Well, and, and I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not. No, 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 no. I'm not. I'm apologizing for myself here because I think you're going to say something that is going to offend somebody. And she'll tell you this. And I've said this for my entire ministry. And in the 20 years we've known each other, she's heard me say this. When you walk into our church, this is the right way to do it. This is what God commanded us to do. If you don't like the way we're doing this, the doors in the back of the church, you can find some place that makes you feel more comfortable. But we've doing we've been doing this since God came down from heaven and said, This is the way we're gonna do it, and we're not changing for you. So if you don't understand why something is being done, please ask. Ask if you think you know. Okay. Um, traditionally, the way that works is this. In the ancient church, in the early church, the service was divided into two sections. Okay? Ministry of the Word, Ministry of the Oh, it's still divided into Ministry of the Word, Ministry of the Sacraments. Okay? And what would happen is, after the reading of the gospel, and no, it was actually I, it was after the creed. It was after the creed and before the offertory. The catechumens would be escorted out of the church. All right. And when they got escorted out of the church, the doors were closed. And during the time of Constantine, well, when the um, when the basilicas were turned over as a as a uh, uh, an apology church there were there were no windows there would usually be slits at the front and later on when the, the churches became more stone oriented there were no windows so what would happen is the catechumens would have to stand up on like a ledger or put blocks or whatever they could find so that they could peer in and kind of get a, a sense as to what was going on, at least to hear. And what would happen is the bells would be rung telling the catechumens the mystery of the Mass is now taking place. Something special is going on. So that they would know, ah, oh, this is the place where we receive the grace of Christ. This is the place where the sacraments are being offered and elevate them until they finish their confirmation and become full members of the church. That's what it meant. So if you will, if you look at it as the mystery of the church and the Eucharist being presented to the to the catechumens, that's why the bells are wrong. Rome turned it into what is known as the, um, it's called the epiclesis. I, I don't use the word because I, I still think the epiclesis is a valid term. But Rome then said, years later, this is like in the 11th, 12th, 1300s, they said years later, when the bells 
the rung, that is the point in which the bread and the wine become the body and blood of Christ because of the descent of the Holy Spirit changing the body and blood of Christ from changing the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. It is because of transubstantiation. And that's why it's rejected, because we don't believe in transubstantiation. So if you're if so on the one hand, the the mystery of the church traditionally is simply that the Eucharist was being celebrated and the catechumens would pay attention. It had nothing to do with transubstantiation at that point. That's way too early. Later on, Rome turned it into the continuation of their doctrine of the sacraments, and it says now, every time I ring the bell, the Holy Spirit's coming down and he's changing the substance of the bread and the wine into the into the substance of the body and blood of Christ. And that's if you read the 39 articles, we reject transubstantiation. Hmm. Okay. I actually didn't know that. Uh, I thought we did believe in transubstantiation, and that was the reason for fasting before communion, <coughs> that we put the body and blood of Christ into us before eggs and bacon. Um, I don't have any problem with anybody fasting before. You okay? Yeah. I don't have any problem with anybody fasting before communion on Sunday. As long as you're not of a mind that you think that that fasting is going to in any way affect your salvation. It's not going to save you. But if you're doing it out of devotion, out of sanctification, out of the, ten, out of, out of the, the desire for holiness to purify yourself, by all means, by all means. But no. In, if you look at your prayer book and you look in the 39 articles, we specifically we specifically uh, repudiate transubstantiation. Do you have your prayer book with you, Beth? Here's Sue. Sure. That's the one day I didn't burn my prayer book. Way in the back. Yeah. yeah, I just didn't have the Bible in front of it, so no, I didn't. You want to tell me to go? Oh, okay. Um, Transubstantiation, or the change of the substance of bread and wine. Notice the substance. In the supper of the Lord cannot be proved by holy writ, but is repugnant to the plain words of Scripture, overthroweth the nature of a sacrament, and hath given occasion to many superstitions. The body of Christ is given, taken, and eaten in the supper only after an heavenly and spiritual manner. And the mean whereby the body of Christ is received and eaten in the supper is by faith. So, Article 28 makes it very clear that Anglicans reject transubstantiation. But then, uh, what does the consecration do if, if it does not change the substance? <laughs> Was that clear to you? It was clear to me. I'll stay back here. Okay. Um, well, right, I, I can give you my my understanding of it. If that's if you're interested, I can tell you what how what I believe is taking place. All right. All right. Let's just let us. is at the right hand of the Father, right? Yeah. Right now. Now, you're down here. Now, at the word 
words of consecration when the priest begins the celebration. When he completes um, when he completes the act of consecration, this is what I this is what I believe occurred. As the church, both individually and collectively, okay? Right. As the church, we are filled with the Holy Spirit, correct? The Holy Spirit is connected to his head, right? Christ. They are never separate. They are never apart from one another. So far, so good? At the words of consecration, what happens is this. Because the Holy Spirit is united to Christ, what I believe happens is that the bread and the wine via the Holy Spirit are connected to and communicate the whole person of Christ, his divine and human nature. And Calvin said that at that moment by faith we are lifted up to heaven. I, at that point I believe Calvin is wrong. I don't believe we're lifted up to heaven. <coughs> and Rome says that Christ is brought down in transubstantiation from the throne and present in the bread and the wine. Christ can never leave the throne or the right hand of the throne in that manner. So when he comes again as the second coming, yes, but not in this. I believe what's happening is this. The Holy Spirit pulls back the veil. He pulls back the earthly division that separates us from the spiritual and it's right here at the altar that because of the Holy Spirit's union with Christ it's as if we are kneeling before Christ himself and he is handing us himself in the bread of the wine that's why the bells that's when the bells become significant that's why incense is, incense is significant and that's why it's significant when the priest utters the words of consecration. Okay? So he, the Holy Spirit just pulls back the veil, and there is Christ seated at the right hand of the Father. Not being pulled down, we're not being lifted up. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. But that mystery means that when Father Yoshi hands you communion, it's as if Jesus himself is behind him hanging. Now, you don't, have to, you don't have to believe that, but that's my understanding, and that's how I negotiate the Lutheran, Reformed, and Roman understanding. I think, we, I think we get too wrapped up, and I say this as a philosopher, I think we get too wrapped up in trying to rationalize everything. And we should just let a mystery be a mystery. Okay, you want to eat? Yeah. yeah.